And just over two months from now, we'll be celebrating the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But if you ever ask yourself, how can we know that the biblical story of the Exodus and all that happened at that time is true? That it's not exaggerated at best or pure myth at worst? Not a wrong question at least to ask ourselves. Well, today I'm going to show how essential and how central to the story of the entire Bible the Exodus is, along with those events that surrounded it. Also, I'll be showing you that we can be certain of the accuracy of the Exodus and the events that surrounded it. Israel ended up in Egypt. We read of that in the book of Genesis. We find that it ends there with them. You know, the book of Genesis is rather interesting. It covers creation. It covers a universal flood, the dividing of languages at Babel, and so much more. All that is within the first 11 chapters. And then from chapters 12 through 50, we read about a family, a man by the name of Abram, and how he didn't have children for a long time, but eventually did, and how he became the father of the faithful. Although Genesis, altogether, Genesis covers a period of about 2,500 years. The story of the Exodus is recounted in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And it took place, as we believe, about 1446 BC. Now, whenever we have dates, some are very exact, some are uh, not so exact, so if I'm off a year or two on some of these, then uh, please bear with me. It's a long time ago, and I don't think any of us can remember it, and after a certain number of years, it really doesn't matter, unless it is critical to a specific prophecy or something like that. But nevertheless, 1446 is what we have traditionally felt is the exodus. And for the sake of time, and because we will likely be covering some of these details as we draw closer to the Passover and during the Days of Unleavened Bread, I'm going to just summarize some of this. The book of Exodus introduces us to the fact that Israel is in Egypt. Israel was freed as a result of a series of devastating plagues that were poured out on the Egyptians the last of which was, is written or found in Exodus, the 12th chapter, the 10th plague in which the firstborn were slain. And we come to the subject of the Passover and how important the Passover is even to this day as we observe the Passover even uh, today. Something that happened so very many years ago, about 3,500 years ago. Israel took seven days to exit Egypt, and we know that that is what we celebrate today, the Days of Unleavened Bread. So something that happened so many years ago is still relevant for us today, and not just us alone, but the uh, Jewish race, the Jewish people still celebrate that. I have at home a, uh, a recording. It might be good to play it sometime. Oh, maybe it wouldn't be. Uh, of uh, the Days of Unleavened Bread. It was, it was uh, recorded a cappello by a group of students up in Canada, not our people at all, Jewish people in, in fact. And uh, the title of one of them is All My Leaven I Will Give to You. And it's to the sound of one of the Beatles songs. So, uh, da 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 da. I, okay, I'll try to sing. But all my leaven I will give to you, and it, it's, uh, it's rather entertaining to say the least, and very well done. The miraculous crossing of the Red Sea is recorded there in Exodus, the 14th chapter, something that is pretty miraculous, and so we might want to know, is it really true? Did they really do that? Or is that something that was developed over a, series of, of a period of time? Much time in Exodus is spent, in the book of Exodus, is spent to describing the tabernacle. And very specific instructions were given to build the tabernacle. Over in Exodus, the 37th chapter, we read about one of the 
items that was to be put in to the tabernacle, Exodus 37, and I'll begin in verse 1. It says, Then Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits was its length, a cubit and a half its width, a cubit and a half its height. He overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside and made a molded molding of gold all around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold to be set in its four corners, two rings on one side, two rings on the other side of it. And he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. Verse 5, he put the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark to bear the ark. He also made the mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits was its length and a cubit and a half its width. He made two cherubim of beaten gold. He made them of one piece at the two ends of the mercy seat. And one cherub at one end of this uh, side and the other cherub at the other end on the side. He made the cherubim of two ends at the two ends of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim spread out their wings above and covered the mercy seat with their wings. And they faced one another. The faces of the cherubim were toward the mercy seat. So very specific instructions that were given there concerning this specific object, a very important object that was to be put into the uh, holy place, the holy of holies, specifically behind a curtain. Have you ever gone through something over a period of time and, and suddenly after decades in the church had an awakening, something that you never saw before. Reminds me of uh, one of our ministers years ago, some of the old timers remember David John Hill. He was a very colorful uh, individual. And I remember one time, I, I don't remember whether in a sermon or in a class, it seemed like it was in a class, but it, I don't remember the exact occasion, but I, he was talking, he was going through the book of Genesis and he was talking about the serpent and the tree. And he suddenly stopped and he said, well, the serpent was in a tree, wasn't he? Well, it doesn't say that. And it was kind of like a, an epiphany, something that, that came on him. He realized that he'd been picturing this serpent in a tree all those years in the Garden of Eden. And yet the fact of the matter was and is that we don't know that the serpent was in a tree. It doesn't say that. Now, most of us have seen pictures of the Ark of the Covenant, and we see them carrying it on poles through the wilderness. Or, as Mr. Ames mentioned uh, a week ago, talking about uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think he had the wrong, wrong uh, movie, but anyway, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, he had that correct there and everything, and they look at the Ark and all this, this happens. And so we see in that movie they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant, uh, the Nazis there, and Indiana Jones is going to blow it up if they don't let this uh, young lady loose. Well, we're all familiar with that. But that's not exactly the way that God intended them to carry the ark. Let's go over to Numbers, the fourth chapter. This is just kind of a side point. But it's something that I'd never really focused on before I was reading through this. And it suddenly struck me that the picture that we often have is not accurate. That the ark was carried by poles, by the, the priest, but the average person would not see what we have in our minds as seeing. Notice in the fourth chapter of Numbers in verse 4, this is the service of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of meeting Relating to the most holy things, when the camp prepares to journey, Aaron and his son shall come, and they shall take down the covering veil and cover the ark of the testimony with it. Then they shall put on it a covering of badger skins. Some think dolphins, it's not exactly badger skins, but some sort of skins there and spread over that a cloth entirely of blue, and they shall insert its poles. So when they carried the ark from one place to another, it wasn't where they could see the, the cherubim and everything. It was covered when they carried it. It was considered sacred, and only the priests were allowed, and even the priests that 
had that responsibility to go in there at times like that, could see it. Even the ones who carried it didn't see the ark. It's one of those little details that kind of pass right over your head, doesn't it? You just don't think about it. Maybe you have, maybe you've known that forever. Uh, I somehow, I've read that a number of times and it passed right over my head. But that's the way they carried it. Now, in later years, did they continue to carry it that way when uh, it was taken captive and everything? We, we don't know. Uh, but that was the instruction that God gave to the, uh, the priest and the way that they were to carry it. They were to cover it whenever they took it out of the Holy of Holies. In Exodus, the 40th chapter, in verse 17, we read that the tabernacle that had the Ark of the Covenant and everything else that was involved there. Uh, the tabernacle was raised up on the first day of the first month of the second year. And so that's at the very end of the book of Exodus. And so we find that the book of Exodus covers a period of about one year. I say of about one year because we don't know exactly how long those uh, miracles took place, the, the plagues that were poured out, and it begins with with uh, Noah and, uh, not Noah, uh, with Moses. And so it, it covers uh, approximately one year, maybe a, a little bit longer than that, but not much longer than that, because it, it uh, ends with the first day of the first month of the second year. Now Leviticus covers the religious aspects of sacrifices and laws and various things there and how long that was and exactly when it was written we don't know but Numbers is a pivotal book because it covers 38 years and 10 months of the Exodus almost the entirety of what we consider the Exodus not just coming out of Egypt but coming to the promised land. Numbers 1 begins on the first day of the second month of the second year. But the actual beginning of Numbers goes back a little bit earlier because it goes back in chapter 9 verse 1 where it talks about the Passover of that second year which would be the 14th day of the first month. But it begins at the beginning pretty much of the second year. And they began their journey from Sinai on the 20th day of the second month of the second year. So uh, shortly after the year had begun, the second year. Now, Numbers records how Israel complained and rebelled against Moses and Aaron. In reality, they were complaining against God, as we understand. And the 14th chapter brings it to a head with the rebellion that took place where they could have gone into the promised land, but they were fearful of doing so except for Joshua and Caleb. And as a result, God condemned them to 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Now we understand that the 40 years include the first year there, but they would not enter into the promised land for a period of 40 years. And everybody over the age of 20 or 20 years and above would die in the wilderness. They would not go into the promised land. There are a lot of other events in the book of Numbers. I'd like to turn over to the 20th chapter of Numbers. And there's a reason for this, which we'll see a little bit later. But Numbers 20 and verse 14. It says, Now Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. This is Numbers 20, verse 14. Thus says your brother Israel, you know all the hardship that has befallen us. Now this would obviously be toward the end of the 40 years. How our fathers went down to Egypt and we dwelt in Egypt a long time and the Egyptians afflicted us and our fathers. When we cried out to the eternal, he heard our voice and sent the angel and brought us out of, the, out of Egypt. Now here we are in Kadesh, a city on the edge of your border. Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards. We're not going to destroy your fields, your vineyards. We're going to do this in an orderly fashion. Nor will we drink water from wells to actually deplete the, the wells with that many people. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or the left until we have passed through your territory. 
Then Edom said to him, You shall not pass through my land, lest I come out against you with the sword. So the children of Israel said to him, We will go by the highway, and if I or my livestock drink any of your water, then I will pay uh, for it. Let me only pass through on foot, nothing more. And he said, You shall not pass through, or that was Edom's reply, You shall not pass through. So Edom came out against them with many men and with a strong hand. Thus Edom refused to give Israel passage through his territory, so Israel turned away from him. Now the children of Israel, the whole congregation, journeyed from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in, in Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered to his people. In other words, he would die at that place, at that time. And so this is coming to the end of the 40 years. I just read that last verse to get some perspective on when this was. This wasn't at the beginning of their 40 years wandering, but toward the end of it. Another very important event took place that we could read of in Numbers the 22nd through the 24th chapters, and that's where Balak hired Balaam to curse Israel. And instead of cursing Israel, Balaam pronounced blessings on them time and time and time again. But we also read how when Balaam realized he could not curse Israel, he taught Balak to teach the children to commit sin. And so there were marriages between those people and the children of Israel, and they began worshiping their gods, the gods of the land. And God then uh, struck a number of Israelites as a result of that. So Balaam taught them, taught Balak how to bring about a curse on Israel, even though it was very clear that God did not intend to curse Israel. As we go through the book of Deuteronomy, we find many references here to the Exodus, of course. This is at the end of the 40 years. This is in the, the beginning of the 11th month of the 40th year. And it's interesting the way that the book opens up here. And verse 2, it says, It is 11 days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In other words, it's an 11-day journey to the Promised Land. Now it came to pass in the 40th year, in the 11th month, on the first day of the month, that Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him as commandments to them. After he had killed Sion, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Hashbon, and Og, king of Bashan, and uh, so forth. So we see there that it took them 40 years to cover a very short journey. And the book of Deuteronomy then goes through all the history there, as well as adding other things and showing us why uh, it took so long and recounts all the, the events of them and gives them encouragement and admonitions. And the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy and verse 34, he says, did God ever try to go and take for himself a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, by wonders, by war, by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Now, I, I bring this out because this is 40 years later, almost 40 years later. Actually, it's, it is 40 years from the, probably the beginning of the plagues there. And all those people who had lived, who are 20 years and under, under, would have remembered those things, at least many of them would. They would remember those things 40 years later. In fact, they lived, many of them were born during that time of wandering, and they were probably teenagers by this time, or in their 20s or 30s, uh, by the time that this took place. So there was a, a huge number of people that were well aware of what took place at that time. And so Moses couldn't write something there that they would all know would be uh, a false and inaccurate. In the 16th chapter, verses 1 to 3, Deuteronomy 16, 
verses 1 to 3, he says, Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. Now, there would have been many people that would have remembered that. If you were a teenager at the time, or even younger than that, you would have certainly remembered that event. And he says, remember that. Therefore you shall sacrifice the Passover to the Lord your God from the flocks and the herds in the place where the Lord chooses to place his name. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction and the fact that God brought them out of the land of Egypt during that time. Again, there would have been many people there that would have remembered it. Only a very few that had been born more recent in times would not remember that. All those under the age of 20 uh, that survived and, and lived to this time would have remembered it if they were, uh, I say, if they were a little bit more than just a few years of age, but they were 10, 12, 14, 16, uh, 18 years of age, they would remember that, plus all those that were born during the 40 years. They would remember not the Passover itself, but they would have been very close to it. They would have heard the stories. They would have been keeping uh, the Passover, although there's some dispute about that. But they would, they would know about that. They would heard, have heard the stories from their parents and their brothers and sisters who were somewhat older. And verse 6, it says, but at the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide, there you shall sacrifice the Passover at twilight, at the going down of the sun, at the time you came out of Egypt. So this was very much in the minds of these people. They understood their history at that time. Verse 12, it says, And you shall remember that you are slaves in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. And they were to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and everything else there. They were given those, those statutes, those laws. This was very much fresh on their minds. If we think back 40 years, for any of us who are here, we remember what happened 40 years ago. Unless we have dementia or something, we remember those events, or if we were at least old enough to, to remember. We skip now down to the book of Joshua because Joshua was the one that took over after Moses died. And when we read the book of Joshua, uh, we believe that Joshua was the author of the book, although there are parts of it that clearly have been edited to bring it up to date, things that he couldn't tell about his own death, of course, uh, that sort of thing. And there's great debate as to whether Joshua was the author of it, but Jewish tradition says that Joshua was the author of this book. And, and so we have events here that, again, people would remember. Notice the second chapter and verse 8. It records that not only did the Israelites know about these things, but the people of the land that they were going into had heard of them. The spies go out and they go to the uh, residence of Rahab and it says before they lay down in verse 8 Joshua 2 verse 8 she came up to them on the roof and said to the men I know that the Lord or the eternal has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint hearted because of you why for we have heard how the eternal dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. So here was this uh, woman, this harlot, in the city of Jericho. And she goes on to say in verse 11, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord, or eternal your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. They had seen the power of God or heard the reports of it, how they came through the Red Sea. And it terrified them. And then these two kings, Og and, and uh, Sion, were mighty kings at that time. And and Israel defeated them. And so the inhabitants of Jericho 
were terrified of the children of Israel. And they gathered together within their city, but as we know the story, it didn't uh, help them out. The walls did not hold up. In the ninth chapter of Joshua, we read of another account here where they were still familiar with the Exodus. Ninth chapter, verse 1, it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of the Jordan in the hills and the lowlands and in all the coasts of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites heard about it, that they gathered together to fight with Joshua. In other words, Jericho and Ai had fallen, and so these others decided that we better gather together and form a league uh, to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, Ai, they worked craftily and went and pretended to be ambassadors and took oil, I'm sorry, took old stocks, old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins uh, torn and mended. And we're familiar with this story, how they pretended to be people from a far off land. And so Joshua made a a pact with them, and as we know, it didn't work out too well. It was, uh, they were tricked by them, and yet they swore to them, and they had to keep that. Now, the book of Judges, when we come to the next book, not Joshua, but Judges, we come to the book of Judges, we find that Joshua died at the age of 110. And tradition says that he was 85 at the end of the time uh, of Moses' death, and so he lived on another 25 years. Uh, we could read Judges, the second chapter, and verse 8, where it says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years of old, of age. And so we, we come to this time where he was 65 years from the time that they walked through the Red Sea. 65 plus or minus a few months, one way or the other. Now, 65 years ago, that sounds like a long time if you're 16 or 25. But I remember 65 years ago. I'm sorry to reveal my age here a little bit. But uh, I remember that, and I see some other old heads out here, and I know that you can remember 65 years ago. So if this were the exodus that had taken place, coming through the Red Sea, 65 years ago, I guarantee I would remember that. I was thinking about this in this context, what happened 65 years ago. Uh, I, I was, uh, what, 12, 13 years of age at the time, 13, I guess. And I remember, actually 12, and, and we were going over to England on the USS Darby. Still remember the name of the ship. It was one of those World War II transport carriers that they had refitted in certain ways so they could take civilians or military families over. And besides getting seasick for about three days on the trip to, to England, I remember one of the, the fondest memories was watching a movie that they had there for basically the kids. And it was on the subject of the Bell X-1 that Chuck Yeager flew breaking the sound barrier. I, I still remember that. I still remember Bell X-1. And it was a documentary on him breaking the sound barrier. And it hit me last night, something I had not thought about. If I wasn't there, I was there very shortly afterward because that's where my father was, was transferred when I was pretty young. And one of my memories back then was we had a, the, the housing, military housing was not too fancy, especially for people of lower rank at that time. And we had a, a beehive in the side of the house and I didn't think they should be there, so I took a block of wood and killed a few of them, and they chased me, and 
and I got stung, uh, I think just once or twice, maybe more. But I remember that. But that goes back to the time I was probably three years of age. But I, it, it just hit me last night. I was probably there, or very shortly after, Jaeger was there. I know my father talked about him at that time. And here I'm going over on a boat to England and watching a movie about something that I may have actually been there of. You know, when we start thinking back 65 years, it's not that long. It really isn't. I was thinking here, uh, Mr. Ames. I don't think he's here today, is he, Mr. Ames? Yes, he is here today. Oh, oh okay, there you are, okay. Well, I, I'll go ahead and tell it anyway. <laughs> 65 years ago, Mr. Ames was about 22. Now, if this were the Exodus, unless his name was... Joshua or Caleb, he'd be over 20 years of age. I'm sorry, Mr. Ames, you wouldn't be here if you think about it that way. But anybody younger, two years younger than that, would remember the Exodus. It's one of those things that it just wasn't that long ago. Now, I know that Mr. Ames' memory is pretty good, probably a lot better than mine. 65 years ago, I'm sure he can tell us exactly where he was and what he was doing and so forth. In Joshua, the 24th chapter, going back to Joshua once again, we read here at the end of Joshua's life, 65 years again from the time of the children of Israel leaving Egypt. And he begins, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods in old or olden times. So he goes back even before the Exodus, but things that were recorded by Moses. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. So he begins going through a history lesson. And it's interesting how often you read in Scripture history lessons. And history is very important for the understanding of the Bible. And often an individual goes back, such as Stephen in the New Testament, and he goes back and he goes through the whole history of Israel. They were very familiar with their history, much more so than we are today. Today, History is, is really not taught very well or very much in school. I confess, I was not interested in history growing up until I came into the church and suddenly had a framework for history when you, know, you read about uh, Daniel, the second chapter, and the four great empires. Then you begin to have a framework. You begin to have a board in which to put the, the pegs, like a peg board without the, I mean, pegs without the board. But we don't teach history very well today. And many of our young people get all of their news, all of their understanding off the internet, and that's a very poor source for learning about the real world and what, what's out there. In fact, it's a good way to get a lot of pollution of ideas. But here we, we go through this history lesson that, that uh, Joshua gives to them. And then we come down to verse 25. It says, So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made for them a statute and ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by this uh, sanctuary of the Lord. Verse 27, And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness to you, for it has heard all the words of the Eternal which he spoke to us. 
It shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So he gave them a history lesson. He warned them about a number of things and how they probably wouldn't stay faithful. And then he wrote on a stone. Now, why is that important? Well, writing existed in those days. They recorded these things in writing. And so whether the book of Joshua or Judges was actually formalized at this time or a later time really is not uh, necessarily important because they would have used records that they had as well as probably some oral traditions that would have been preserved. But they had many written records, no doubt, at that time as whole libraries have been found uh, in, in previous uh, times. I think at Ebla or Elba, uh, wherever it is there in, uh, I think, Lebanon, uh, they, they found a library with all kinds of records. And we know that when we read the books of, uh, of Daniel, for example, or uh, Ezra, Nehemiah, uh, you know, after the, the exile, uh, we, we find that they would be able to search the records. People back then were not all that different from us today. I know that's hard, a hard sell. It's a hard sell for me because they wore different clothes, they spoke different languages, but they were human beings just like us. And they did certain things in an orderly fashion. Here, Joshua writes on a stone so they can see it and says, you know, this stone has heard all these words that I've spoken today. Well, he knew it didn't have ears, but he wrote on that stone so they would have a record for the future. Let's go over to Judges, the sixth cha second chapter again, Judges 2. And we'll begin in verse 6 this time. It says, When Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. So now we're at the end of the life of Joshua. And it says that all the elders who outlived him, who had seen the works of the eternal, they were faithful to God for what, another 10, 15, maybe 20 years. Some of those elders were not sure. But they certainly would have been passing on the lessons to the next generation. And yet we know that the next generation, after Joshua and the elders who outlived him, did not remain faithful to God. But they certainly would have heard those stories, and some of them did remain faithful. Notice over in the sixth chapter, Josh, Judges 6, Judges 6 and verse 13. This is the time of Gideon. And he said to him, O oh my Lord, if the eternal is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the eternal has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So Gideon was familiar with those stories. Their fathers had told them, had passed those stories down to them. But they didn't obey the laws of God as they should have because of those stories. And so all these terrible things came upon them. But they were aware of those stories. They were aware of their history. Notice over in the uh, 11th chapter of Judges, 11th chapter we come down to the time of Jephthah. And it is believed that this account was toward the end of the time of the judges. Uh, everything is not necessarily in chronological order as you go through the book of Judges, and there were perhaps overlapping judges at different places, different times. But we, we come to Jephthah in the 11th chapter and verse 12. It says, Now Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon, saying, 
What do you have against me that you have come to fight against me in my land? And the king of the people of Ammon answered the messengers of Jephthah, and he gives them this answer because, this is verse 13, Israel took away my land when they came up out of Egypt. So here are the Midianites, and I'm sorry, the Ammonites, and they remember from their history when Egypt, um, Israel came up out of Egypt, but they've got a little bit mixed up here. It says, from the Arnon as far as the Jabbok, and to the Jordan. Now therefore restore those lands peaceably. But Jephthah replied, and he again sent messengers to the king of the people of Ammon and said to him, thus says Jephthah, quote, Israel did not take away the land of Moab nor the land of the people of Ammon. For when Israel came up from Egypt, they walked through the wilderness as far as the Red Sea and came to Kadesh. Then Israel sent messengers, remember we read this earlier, to the king of Edom, saying, Please let me pass through your land. But the king of Edom would not heed. In a like manner they sent to the king of Moab, but he would not consent. So Israel remained in Kadesh. Verse 18, And they went along through the wilderness and bypassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab, came to the east side of the land of Moab, and camped on the other side of the Arnon. But they did not enter the border of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Now, when you stop to think about this, here's this individual, Jephthah, and he's giving them a history lesson. He is, they tried to rewrite it, and he's saying, no, this is how it happened, as we read earlier. He knew the true history of what had taken place. And when you think about it, he knew his history. How well do we know our history today? Probably not so well because we have a lot of people that are trying to rewrite or destroy the history of this nation. But they knew what their, their history was. And they went along in the wilderness, verse 18, bypassed those lands, including, you know, the, speaking of the border of the Arnon River and, and so forth. Verse 19, then Israel sent messengers to Sion, king of the Amorites, king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, please let us pass through your land into our place. So they were not start, wanting to start a fight at all. But Sion did not trust Israel to pass through his territory. So Sion gathered all his people together, encamped in Jahaz, and fought against Israel. And the eternal God of Israel delivered Sion and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they defeated them. Thus Israel gained possession of all the land of the Amorites who inhabited that country. They took possession of all the territory of the Amorites, from the Arnon to the Jabbok, and from the wilderness of the Jordan. And now the eternal God, or the, yeah, the eternal God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel, uh, should you then possess it. Israel took this land, should you then take it over? It wasn't your land, but do you want to take it over now? Will you not possess whatever Chemosh your God gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord your God takes possession of before us, we will possess, or the Lord our God. And now, verse 25, are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel? Did he ever fight against them? So he goes back to the time of Balak, who hired someone to curse Israel, but he did not come out and fight against them as such. He corrupted Israel. But very clearly, Jephthah knows the true history. He says, therefore, or he says, uh, verse uh, 26, while Israel dwelt in Heshbon and its villages, and Aurora and its villages, and in all the cities along the banks of the Arnon, for 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time? If they were yours, you had 300 years, why didn't you recover them? Well, the fact is they weren't theirs. But he's going back 300 years, and he knows the history. And he knows it very well because we know some of the history that was recorded at an earlier time. It's remarkable what was known then, and we sometimes think of them as being primitive, and I guess the world thinks of them as little more than cavemen. 
But these were very intelligent people, and they knew what the true history was. Let's go over to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. And we'll go to the 12th chapter. This is a, a little bit later, not a lot later, but Jephthah took us down to about 1146 BC, and this would probably be 300 plus years after Egypt. But in 1 Samuel 12 and verse 6, it says, Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who raised up Moses and Aaron, and who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still that I may reason with you before the Lord concerning the right, righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and your fathers. When Jacob had gone into Egypt, and your fathers cried out to the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera. So he's uh, talking about goes past that. But again, this is a history lesson. And here is Samuel giving the people a history lesson to remind them where they came from and how they came out of Egypt and how they forsook God after that. The 15th chapter of 1 Samuel is interesting from this perspective that God, through Samuel, told Saul to destroy the Amalekites. Now, why did he want them to destroy the Amalekites? Well, because going back to Israel coming out of, out of Egypt, the Amalekites attacked the weak and the stragglers at the end of the column. They were terrorists, as Mr. Hernandez has pointed out. Uh, that was the Amalekites. And so here is many years, this, is, this goes down to uh, the time of Saul, and he was king for 40 years, and so this brings us, you know, to a much later time. And probably about 350 years after the, the Exodus, and I say 350, it could be 20, one way or the other. But it's quite a, a period of time. And God had not forgotten. Samuel knew, but this is recorded because of what happened way back earlier. We now come to the reign of David. And David reigned from about 1010 BC to 970 BC, approximately. And in 2 Samuel 7, just pointing out that all the way through here, we find that the children of Israel, certain ones of them, the, the leading ones, prophets and others knew the history of Israel and, and fairly normal people, you know, Gideon and, and Jephthah, these were not uh, kings as such at the time. They were individuals who really didn't, they just saw themselves as ordinary people, but they knew the history of their nation. And so in 2 Samuel 7 and verse 23, this is where God made a covenant with David. David wanted to build God a house, and God said, no, I'm going to make a name for you. And verse 23, 2 Samuel 7, 23, And who is like your people, like Israel, the one, the one nation on the earth, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people to make for himself a name, and to do for yourself great and awesome deeds for your land? before your people whom you redeem from yourself from Egypt, the nations and their gods. Again, it reflects back on the history of the nation going all the way back to Egypt. Now we turn over to Psalm 78. Psalm 78 is important because here again, this is a history lesson. And this, this was a Psalm of Asaph and there, there's some dispute as to when Asaph lived, but uh, at least the, the first Asaph seemed to have lived during the time of David. And it says here in Psalm 78, verse 1, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, 
and our fathers have told us. Notice, and our fathers have told us. They have taught us these things. There were always those individuals in their nation that had not forsaken God, and they would pass down. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonder, wonderful works that he has done. Verse 5, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers. Well, when was that? When did he give them that law? It was during the Exodus, the time of that. Which he commanded our fathers, they should make them known to their children. They should pass them on to their children. Remember Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, where we are, in, in fact, even before that, if you go back to Exodus, the 13th chapter and so forth, they were to teach their children about the Passover and about these other things. That the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children to their grandchildren and generation after generation that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments you know there are really two things one is to know the history and another one is to live according to the commandments that God gave as a result of it it may not be like your fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation a generation that did not set its heart right and whose spirit was not faithful to God Verse 9, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in the law and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shown them. They didn't remember how God had worked with them previously. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt and the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters stand up like a heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and at night with a light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness. He gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought streams out of the rock and caused water to run down like rivers. Again, we have an incredible history lesson that they understood. Sure, they, they may have read those, those books of, of, of Moses, but these things have been passed down from generation to generation. All of this has been preserved. God caused the, the writings and everything to be preserved down to their time. And this is a time when, you know, the, the beginning of the uh, first millennia uh, B.C. We have the book of Kings that covers a period from about 1,000 to 600 B.C. And in 1 Kings, the 6th chapter, 1 Kings 6, we have a, a pivotal scripture, very important scripture. 1 Kings 6, beginning in, well, in fact, we'll just read verse 1. It says, It came to pass... And the 480th year after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Egypt, and the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, the month of Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord, or the Eternal. So this is when Solomon began to build the temple. And that's about uh, 966. Again, there's some dispute on these dates, but I think we have traditionally said 966. It's 480 years from the Exodus. Now, 480 years is a pretty long time. But notice that he builds the temple, if you want to read through the account, and he builds it somewhat on the pattern of the tabernacle. But in addition to that, we see that the tabernacle was still in existence at the time. Notice 1 Kings, the 8th chapter, and verse 1. Now Solomon assembled the elders of Israel. Verse 2, therefore the men of Israel assembled with King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. So they were still keeping, or from time to time, you know, they had been keeping the feasts of the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. 
Wow, 480 years after the ark had been constructed, it still existed. This was a remnant of the past. Now, obviously, people would know what this is, where it came from, what was some of the history of it. They would have known about walking around Jericho with the ark and how God caused the, the uh, walls of Jericho to fall down. So all the elders came and the priests took up the ark. Then they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tabernacle of meeting. Notice the tabernacle of meeting. And all the holy furnishings that were in the tabernacle, the priests and Levites brought them up. So these things were still in existence 480 years after they had been constructed at the very beginning, the first year of coming out of Egypt. Notice verse 7, the cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark. Verse 8, the poles extended so that the ends of the poles could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary. So they still were carrying it around with poles. Verse 9, nothing was in the ark except the two tablets of stone which Moses put there at Horeb. So the Ten Commandments were still in the ark at that time. Apparently the Aaron's rod that budded and the pot of manna were not. It's because that's all that was there. And it confirms that over in 2 Chronicles 5 and verse 10. So consider the ark and the Ten Commandment stones had been around for almost 500 years by this time. That's an amazing thing. They were still around. And obviously they would have known where they came from and what had been done. In 2 Chronicles 20, I'm just going to refer to this here, you can look it up, verses 10 and 11, we have reference to Jehoshaphat's day, to his time, and he takes us back to the time of the Exodus again, he refers to that. Many of the prophets referred to Egypt and the Exodus. Jeremiah prophesied from, I'll just say roughly 630 to 585, uh, over that period of time, the time when Judah was going into captivity just before and down till the captivity and after uh, Jerusalem had fallen. In the second chapter of Jeremiah, verses 5 and 6, it says, you might want to just write this down, it says, Thus says the Lord, what injustice have your fathers found in me that they have gone far from me, have followed idols and have become idolaters? Neither did they say, where is the Lord or the Eternal who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land that no one crossed. So this was still something that they understood. This is going on roughly 900 or 800 years after the Exodus took place. And this was still well known. Notice the seventh chapter of Jeremiah, where very famous passage there, where he says, I did not speak to your fathers in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. Again, a reference there. I, I don't have time to cover all the references that we have, the, the covenant that God made uh, there in Jeremiah, the, 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 the 31st chapter. Uh, Ezekiel talks about Ahola and Aholaba and their harlotry which began in Egypt. Hosea mentions Israel coming out of Egypt numerous times. Micah mentions the same. Micah mentions about Balaam, the son of Baor. So this was, again, this was knowledge that was understood. After the Babylonish captivity, the post-exile period, we have Daniel, the ninth chapter, Verse 15, where it says, And now, O Lord, our God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name as it is this day. And this was his prayer of repentance. He says, We have sinned, we've done wickedly. In Nehemiah, the ninth chapter, again, post-exile, 
this would be down, you know, five, well, Nehemiah would be about, let's see, it, it'd be 400 and something, uh, late 400s BC. So we're looking a thousand years down the road. Um, and, and the Levites rehearsed Israel's history to them beginning in Nehemiah 9 and verse 7. But let's come to the New Testament. Let's come down to the New Testament and we'll just cover some things quickly here. Jesus kept the Sabbath. We know that the Sabbath came from creation, but how did anybody know about it? Well, Moses recorded that fact. Moses recorded Genesis, the second chapter, how God rested on the Sabbath. But it was codified in the Ten Commandments and also in a special covenant in the 31st chapter of Exodus as a special covenant with Israel. So when Jesus kept the Sabbath and all the Jews were keeping it there, it really goes back to a far earlier time. Christ as our Passover is at the heart of the gospel. Now the first messianic prophecy was recorded by Moses in Genesis 3 and verse 15 where it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So it goes back there, but more importantly, the Passover itself was a, was a, was a, uh, a prediction, a type of Christ being sacrificed, the, the Lamb of God, the true Lamb of God, as we read there in 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, or the fifth chapter, verse, verse 7. For Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. All of this goes back to that time. Unleavened bread is one of the festivals of God, and it pictures the time when Israel came out, that seven-day period, until they went through the Red Sea. In fact, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians 10, and I'm sure this will be read many times in the days leading up to and including the days of unleavened bread. But here's the Apostle Paul, and he's going into some history. He says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. He goes right back to the crossing of the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. He understood the spiritual lesson of going through the Red Sea, a type of baptism, a type of putting their past life behind and coming up to a new way of life. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual rock. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And then he points out this history lesson that God was not pleased with most of them, and he points out various sins that were committed there, and how they all died in the wilderness, those who were over 20 years of age, except for Joshua and Caleb. He goes through a bit of that history. We're familiar with 1 Corinthians 10, very important passage there. Look at, at 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 2. And verse 15. And you could also read this in the book of Jude. He's talking about, verse 12, these like natural brute beasts made to be caught and destroyed speak evil of things they do not understand. And then in verse 15 it says, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey speaking with a man's voice restrained the madness of the prophet. Again, the history of the, the people was understood by Peter and by others. In Revelation, the second chapter, the Apostle John, by inspiration of God, also refers to Balaam. Revelation 2.14 but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. 
Now, either we are to say that the writers of the New Testament had just, you know, been duped. They clearly understood these things. They believed these things. These things had come down to them generation after generation. There were generations when they were very poorly understood, when maybe only a few people, and sometimes they had to be rediscovered, the book of uh, the law being rediscovered by one of the kings. But this was their history, and they understood their history, and we need to understand the history. In Hebrews, the eighth chapter, six to ten, it's a reference back to the old covenant given at Sinai, quoting from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. Jesus and all the New Testament writers quoted from the works of Moses. And the author of the book of Hebrews goes into great detail regarding the tabernacle and its furnishings. And we see spiritual lessons from all those things that happened back then, whether it be the Passover, looking forward to Christ, or whether it be the tabernacle and all the structure there, how it was a type of God's throne in heaven. All of this was, was done for a spiritual lesson and a purpose. Remember, Paul said that does God care for oxen or does he care for the people who are serving uh, in, in the temple or in the service of God? The unity of Scripture is remarkable beyond any humanly devised book. I'd like to refer to the Bible fact or fiction. I'm not going to read from it. But I'd like to refer that to you because it gives some of the extra biblical information. I'm just going through the Bible itself today. But it talks about archaeology a bit and various other sources, and it's a very important booklet on the subject, and it's good for us to be reminded from time to time. Because one thing is, is true, and that is that the critics, the Bible critics, have tried to say, well, David didn't live, and we don't know that Moses was a real figure, and they, they, they try to pick apart the Bible, but then God, every once in a while, allows them to discover something that supports what the Bible says. And they come to realize when it comes down to a real contest, the Bible wins every time. Now they keep picking at it. But think about it. The Bible was written by, some say, as many as 40 different authors. E even Balaam is an author, author, if you think about that. There are 40 different authors. It was written over a period of some 1,500 years. And yet there is this incredible unity of Scripture. You can look at Genesis and Revelation and the comparison and how many, how many uh, uh, things are, you know, that you have the Garden of Eden, you have uh, the, uh, the river that flows out of the garden, and then, of course, the, the river of living water. And, and you just have these parallels between... Genesis and Revelation. I think Bollinger's Companion Bible lists all these parallels. There's 20 some odd parallels between them. There's Babel of old and then there's end time Babylon. You have all those parallels. But written over a period of some 1500 years, it was recorded all the way from Babylon to Rome. I was looking this up it's more than 1,800 miles as the crow flies between the two. And yet parts of it were written in Babylon, parts of it were written in Rome, and every place in between by 40 different authors over a period of some 1,500 years, and yet there's a unity to it. Archaeology has time and again corroborated what the Bible says. And again, I refer to the Bible fact or fiction, brings out some of that information. The Exodus is central in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Genesis because you have the prophecy of the Messiah in Genesis 3. But, okay, if we don't want to count that, we can certainly go from Exodus all the way to the end of Revelation, where there are references to Egypt and to the exodus that took place there. I'd like to quote 
in closing from something from Halley's Bible Handbook. And it's a quote from Winston Churchill. And I'll end with this. He says, we reject with scorn all those learned and labored myths that Moses was but a legendary figure upon whom the priesthood and the people hung their essential social, moral, and religious ordinances. We believe that the most scientific view, the most up-to-date and rational conception will find its fullest satisfaction in taking the Bible story literally. We may be sure that all these things happened just as they are set out according to Holy Writ. We may believe that they happened to people not so very different from ourselves and that the impressions those people received were faithfully recorded and have been transmitted across the centuries with, a far, with far more accuracy than many of the telegraphed accounts we read of goings on of today. And the words of a forgotten work by Mr. Gladstone, we rest with assurance upon, quote, the impregnable rock of Holy Scripture, end of quote. Let men of science and learning expand their knowledge and probe with their researches every detail of the records which have been preserved to us from those dim ages. All they will do is to fortify the grand simplicity and essential accuracy of these recorded truths which have so far lighted the pilgrimage of man.